Yes, great. On. Great. Okay, excellent. So um, Tushar already did the acknowledgments, and that's great. Um, so yeah, I'm going to start by breaking uh, everything Tushar talked about at a very high level down to the nitty gritty details so we can really dive in. So as Tushar mentioned, accelerators are really great in terms of making a very efficient custom data path without the sort of control overheads of a general Turing complete processor. But the sort of off-chip IO wall or off-chip memory wall remains, and they don't do anything to solve that problem. And in fact, in some sense, they even exacerbate the problem because if you make your processing element much more efficient, well, that just means that you're chewing through the data that you have faster. And so you're putting even more pressure on keeping things fed. So I kind of like to use the analogy that that building a custom accelerator is kind of like putting this giant engine in this in this tiny, tiny car, because you're still sort of sipping data through a straw when you have or you have to communicate off chip. Right. And and as uh, why is this important? Well, it's important, A, from a, a bandwidth point of view, but also from an energy point of view. Just that moving data farther takes a lot more energy, right? So if we say, okay, we're going to do 8-bit integer multipliers, well, fetching two 8-bit operands from DRAM is about 100x more energy, you know, and you can find lots of papers that back this up. And even fetching two 8-bit operands from an SRAM is a lot more energy. So a real key aspect of this is going to be keeping the data close to the processing elements that are working on it. Yep. And as, as Tushar said, fortunately, there's a ton of reuse here, right? The total number of multiply and add operations that we do is so much more than the amount of data. Well, that the only way that that math even works is if we're reusing that data for many multiply adds, right? So there's a lot of reuse. Okay, and this is what Tushar exactly said, that we're going to take this, this um, huge map space and map it down, this, this huge number of uh, multiplications and additions, and map it down onto a finite hardware resource, right? So imagine an adversary coming in and saying, oh, you've only got 1,000 PEs, but I'm going to make this neural network a little bit bigger because you know that's going to be how I publish my new publication in NeurIPS, is I'm going to get this some kind of... Uh, better network and it's going to somehow overflow the resources that you provisioned on your hardware well now how are you going to map this thing down onto your finite resources that's what we call the mapping or the data flow problem so like i said i'm going to break this all the way down to the most fundamental building blocks and build us back up to where tashar was so i'm going to start with one dimensional convolution and again this is not what a neural network is well, it is, it is a building block which allows us to get back to the full 7D loop nest. So let's just say we've got a one-dimensional vector of weights, a one-dimensional vector of inputs. Can you guys see my mouse, by the way? Um, yes. Yeah. yes. Great. Okay, great. All right, I'll go to the laser pointer maybe just to uh, make it a little bit better. Great. So one-dimensional vector of weights, one-dimensional vector of inputs, and we want to produce an one-dimensional vector of outputs. And we've got that sliding window that, that Tarshar said. You could think of it like a Gaussian blur. You overlay the weights over the inputs, and that produces one output, right? Then we say, okay, we could, this next thing will contribute to the same output, same output. Now we've got enough information to produce that output. So now we slide the window, and we do it again, and we've got the second output. Okay, but that idea, even by itself, had some ordering assumption, right? So what it was saying is, okay, I've got my inputs, my weights, and my outputs, and now I'm going over the inputs more slowly than I'm going over the weights, right? So the input was changing uh, sorry, the S dimension was changing faster, boop, boop, boop. And then I change my input and then that's when I move on to the next output. So it was sort of the way that I presented this was implying this loop order, right? So how often does the data path change the weight and input every cycle? What about the output every S cycles? And so this leads to this term that this is an output stationary data flow, right? Because the output is changing slowest. You're working on the same output, holding it stationary across many inputs and weights. Right, so, so you see this term stationary a lot in the literature in, invented by my colleague, Joel Emmer. And 
So it's very important to understand it. What we mean by stationary is imagine that you had these different data types, you know, your weights, your, your inputs, your, your outputs, and you can imagine the, the transfer sort of being like a wave with an amplitude and period that it says, oh, every 10 cycles, I need three new weights, right? So the stationary data type, it does change. It does change. It's not stationary for the whole computation, but it changes most slowly. It's the wave which has the longest period. Right. And, you know, just like I, I kind of like this analogy, because just like waveforms, you can have sort of bursts, right, where suddenly, oh, I need a bunch of new things. And that sort of causes this constructive interference. Right. And another side effect of this stationary is that it means that the thing that's moving slowest is also the thing that doesn't get reloaded. Right. So when we were done with this output, we didn't reload it ever again, whereas we did need to reload the weights and the inputs, okay? So there's gonna be a lot of implications to our buffering based on these reuse characteristics. We don't reload outputs in the output stationary data flow. We do reload inputs and weights. And so knowing this is gonna have a lot of implications on how we design our hardware. Now, notice that this stationary name, saying that a data flow is output stationary, input stationary, weight stationary, it gives you some intuition, but it's not a complete specification of all the behavior in a data flow. So we'll get to what a complete specification of a data flow is. Right, yes, exactly. So I think I covered all this, the, not only times, not only the number of times that you will reload something, but how many times will, what is the distance between when you last access it and will access again, that will dictate the buffer size that you will need to, 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 uh, to buffer it. And now, of course, your computer architecture hat comes on and you say, well, if I need a buffer of size a million, well, every time I make my buffer bigger, the energy cost to access the buffer goes up. So is it actually worth it for me to put a buffer of size a million there? Or should I just reload it from DRAM? Yep. So the other thing that I think I want to state explicitly is that there's this assumption here that we can permute these loops, right? That we can permute these loops without any changes. Now, of course, there will be changes to when things, uh, when the operations occur, if you permute the loops. And if you don't choose the size of your accumulator correctly, you can lead into um, changes in results because of course you can change when the saturation occurs, right? So if you saturate earlier and then subtract, then you're going to get a different result. However, what these accelerators do in practice is that they size their accumulators to be bigger than their operands such that they can now do free loop permutation without having to worry about saturation. You can prove, oh, every time I go through an accumulation step, that increases the size of the, the possible output by one bit. And so you can just reason, oh, if I have this big of an accumulator, I now am free to permute this loop any way I want. So of course, we can have picked a different order, right? So in here, I've just changed this loop. I've changed this loop so that the S is on top, right? So now S is moving slower and X is moving faster, okay? So we say, okay, give me a weight and an input that contributes to an output that's exactly like before. But now I'm going to change input. And when I change X, I change both input and output, right? And then I change both input and output, both input and output. And I go all the way down for every weight, doing a partial sum for every output, then a partial sum for every output again, and do it again for the last weight until I finally have a full sum, right? So what data flow is this? What is the, the data type with the longest period in its wave? Well, it's weights, so it's weight stationary, right? And you can also implement input stationary. But of course, if you're doing direct convolution, then it's a little bit hard to do input stationary because you say, okay, I have my two dimensions here are S and X. How do I do it with inputs? It's not that hard though. All you have to do is say, I've got to have some kind of condition, right? Condition that, you know, oops, if the output was actually going to be out of range, then don't do it. Or you could pad, right? Sometimes people will pad to avoid this. So those are the two techniques that you could see if you wanted to do input stationary. So now, as we said, 
imagine an infinite architecture with infinite buffering. Now, it will always do the algorithmic minimum number of accesses to off chip, right? It'll transfer every weight exactly once, every input exactly once, and every sum exactly once, right? That would be the, the, the perfect microarchitecture. But now imagine the opposite. Imagine the worst possible microarchitecture, one with just you know one multiplier, and it just retransferred everything, everything it needed. Well, then it would be the worst case. It would, it would reload everything all the time. And so these are our two bookends. This is the space that we're playing in. The, the perfect thing would load everything exactly once. The worst case thing will lo load everything a quadratic number of times. And we're going to end up somewhere in the middle, ideally as close to the minimum as possible. Yep. So this is just a summary of everything I've said. And notice how these two things multiplied together always equal each other, right? So, so here you say this times this equals s. You, you sort of times these together, right? But now notice there is some subtleties that start coming into play, right? For instance, if you're doing weight stationary, if you're doing weight stationary, you have to read and write each output, right? Because it was partial sums. And so that means that the thing that is read and write is higher. It's a higher component. The reason people love output stationary is output stationary says, oh, the, the thing that is being read and written is the thing that I'm minimizing. Okay, so this is why the data flow does make you know a, a pretty large difference. Or more specifically, I would say that the data flow that the difference between the best case data flow and the worst case data flow is huge. I would say that there are several good data flows that cluster together, and our job is to find those data flows. Right. So let's get more realistic. Right. So let's let's start adding some on-chip buffering, on-chip buffering that will allow us to minimize our accesses to off-chip. Yep. So we're going to add those buffers there and ultimately work towards you know, a, a true buffer hierarchy. So the way to think about adding buffer levels is to think about splitting these indices and then rearranging the loop levels, right? So if our indices into our tensors were X and S, well, then what we're doing is essentially a form of blocking or tiling, right? block or tile, you say, I want to take X and I want to split it into X1, where X1 is the number of passes, and X0, where X0 is the tile size. Okay, so if I have a tile of size 100 and I have a thousand weights, then it takes me 10 passes, right? So then X1 would be 10, X0 would be 100. And similarly, you can do that to weights. Now, of course, notice that if you provision your buffering such that it fits, then that just means that this outer loop degenerates to one, right? So if the, if your weights fit in your weight buffer, then this outer loop is just one pass. But if you're if an adversary comes along and says, "Haha, my new NeurIPS, my new NeurIPS publication blows up the number of weights by a factor of ten," well, you don't say, "Oh man, I can't run that on my accelerator." You say, "No, what that does to my accelerator." is it increases the number of passes that I have to make. It scales up this temporal S1 loop, right? So that is the way to think about adding buffering. Okay, so the energy cost of a mapping is a function of the size of the buffer and the number of times that you have to access each buffer, right? So now look at, remember the, the analogy of the amplitude and period of the waves, and look at how fast each of these statements are changing, right? Here, X1 is changing incredibly slowly, right? Which means that this here is constant over each iteration, each level one iteration, the innermost iteration, right? And so, and now what is changing is these offsets, right? These offsets, but even the offsets, the S0 offset is changing faster than the X0 offset for this particular data flow, right? Yep, yep. And by the way, 
you should think of this even for something like TPU, right? If you think of, oh, Google TPU, you say, oh, well, they, their buffers are really far away from their multipliers. Well, that's not exactly true because you can think of them as having a level zero, right? Level zero is the, the latches that are feeding into your data path, right? And so let's call that like your level zero buffer. And obviously you wanna make the level zero buffer as small and efficient as possible because you will be accessing that every cycle. Yep. If you have a level that's greater than zero, you have data coming in from the previous level, right? That's what we would call a, a, a fill. You have data that comes from that level one, right? So data comes in from the level two to the level one, fills the level one buffer that costs energy. Then you have data that is transferred from the level one down to your level zeros that costs energy. Right. And then you have the level zero working on things. And for outputs, depending on your data flow, you have to write the output back and then reload it. And that's going to cost energy. Yep. So if we look at the weight access costs, we say, okay, here, my S1 is representing a block of weights or a tile of weights that I'm working on. And then every time I increment this S1 variable, I'm shifting which tile I'm working on, right? So as time, as, as time goes by, the tile moves over, right? And then you repeat that for X1 and you say, okay, I'm going to do the whole thing again. Yep, exactly. Right. So how, what does this end up costing? This is the start of an analytical model like Maestro. The start of an analytical model like Maestro, but in the context of 1D convolution, not a full neural network, right? So it says, okay, per level one iteration, I did this many weight reads times this many level one iterations. So my total reads is this. Well, how many times did I have to fill my L0 buffer? Okay, hopefully I filled the L0 buffer less than I read it, and then I'm getting an amplification factor. And you can say, okay, yes, for this particular buffer, it works out that I am actually filling the uh, that buffer less than I'm reading it. And I'm getting an amplification factor that should result in an energy savings as long as accessing that buffer is efficient enough. Yep. And this is what we call disjoint or partition reuse pattern because each tile was disjoint with the last tile. If we look at the inputs, right? The inputs have this funny sliding window pattern where we say, okay, this is how many inputs we need. And as we increment S1, the window slides over just a little bit and just a little bit more, right? Sliding window, right? And it just keeps sliding over and over and over. But you can keep a bunch of the data that was already resident in your buffer still resident. So you don't have to transfer this entire tile. You only transfer the delta between the current tile and the next tile. And again, that's what Maestro does in its analytical model is it compares the delta between what you're working on now with what you're going to be working on in the next time step. And it says, okay, that is the number of fills that you have to do to satisfy it. And that is the energy cost for those fills. Yep. And you, usually you'll see the term halo to be, to mean the, um, the things that are overlapping between the current tile and the next tile. Yep, and you can do the similar math. I don't think we need to go through all the details, but essentially it means this, I read this, this buffer this many times, this buffer that many times. Again, hopefully there's an amplification factor. So this tells you both the minimum size buffer that you need to get the reuse, right? Because you don't want to, you don't want to make your buffer too big, right? You want the buffer to be minimally sized so that you can keep accesses to be very cheap and also area to be cheap. And it says the, um, amplification factor of that buffer, right? So if you can make your tiles bigger, there's usually sort of a quadratic benefit to it, right? Because if you have two in, you know, uh, inputs and weights, making your inputs bigger means you reuse, if you make your input tile bigger, you reuse your weights more. If you make your weights tile bigger, you reuse your inputs more, right? So usually what you see, people do is carefully chose those sizes such that they get a good amount of reuse.
Okay, and now uh, let's do the same thing for outputs. The outputs here, this is where the name stationary comes from, right? As S1 is moving, well, look, S1, the variable S is not used to calculate the index of output, right? So that means anytime we increment either of these two levels, we're not shifting what output we're working on. And so that's where the name stationary comes from. It's just this tile is just resident for a very long time until the tile is resident all the way until this outermost loop increments, and then you get a new tile of outputs. Yep, and you can redo the math for that. So the mapping data summary, you know, for this particular data flow, right, it's going to do this many weight reads at level, level zero, this many input reads, out, output reads doesn't really matter, yeah, output writes, and this is how many times it will fill the buffer. So the ratio between this number with the concrete parameter sizes filled in, right? So if you say, oh, I have a tile of size this, I have a tile of size that, the ratio between this and this is your amplification factor, right? It's how much additional effective bandwidth you're getting from your off chip because you're, you're filtering out those accesses. Okay, so that is everything you need to know about temporal reuse in convolutions. But of course, we don't just want temporal reuse, we want parallelism, right? And so parallelism is a form of spatial partitioning instead of temporal partitioning, right? They're both sort of two sides of the same coin because they're both related to how do you schedule the work onto the workers. But the considerations for spatial scheduling and temporal scheduling are not exactly the same. And so it is worth going through that case, right? So how will we reflect this in the loop nest? Well, what we will do is we will, for lack of a better term, block or tile for parallelism, right? So we will take that level of loops and we will say, aha, I'm going to do some of these loop levels in parallel. Well, what does that mean? It, it means in some sense that the index here is going much faster, right? You're sort of saying, oh, instead of incrementing by one, I'm going to increment by the number of PEs that I have, right? So I'm going to churn through this work more quickly, okay? Right, so we're not introducing a completely new technique for parallelism. What we're saying is, you make your loop nest, you cut your loop nest up into, into bits, you get the order of the loops into what you want, and then you decide, oh, this level should be done in parallel. Well, how do you know which levels are good to do in parallel, right? So let's, let's, let's look at it for, let's be concrete. Okay, let's say that we set X1 to be two, and we said, okay, I want S1 to be this, this PE does this half, this PE does that half, right? Oh, sorry, no, what this is saying is let's just have one PE for this, right? So we'll have two, two PEs at this level and one PE at that level. So in some sense, we're removing this loop because as we said, a for loop that goes from zero to one is you can just think of it as not being there. And by the way, that applies both to space and to time, right? So now what would happen if we just look at this kind of parallelization on our 1D convolution? Okay, so what we're saying is, okay, in the X dimension, I'm gonna be working on two different tiles of inputs. And that means that I'm gonna be working on two different outputs at the same time. Now notice what's going on with the weights, right? We didn't do any parallelism on the weights. That means that both of these workers are working with the same set of weights, right? And then slide and do it again. Okay, so if you, I won't go through it, but um, is there an implementation opportunity for efficiency? And the answer is yes. In the temporal world, the opportunity was that we could keep things buffered and reaccess the buffer instead of reloading them. In the spatial world, on the spatial side of the coin, the opportunity is to fetch a data, access a buffer once and multicast that data to multiple consumers. Right? So how do we know if there's a multi multicast opportunity? 
Well, look at the weight here. It's what I said, that the weight is being indexed by the S0. And that means no matter what index of, of processing element you are, you're accessing the same weight in this particular data flow. And that means there's a multicast opportunity. And then you can work through. So what about, what about things that aren't the same? Then we have the opportunity to make better use of our bandwidth to fetch, fetch more things at once, right? So I won't go through the entire example since we're a little low on time, but you guys can look at it offline. So what's this saying? Let's look at the, let's look if we made the other choice. What if we said, let's keep the S1 loop, but let's get rid of the X loop, right? So now we have two PEs and they're gonna be working on a disjoint set of weights. But what does this do to my data flow? Okay. I won't animate it, but basically what it does is it means that some PEs will be working on this weight, some PEs will be working on that weight. And those PEs will be contributing to the same output, right? So how do we handle this weird case you know, on, on the face of it, it looks kind of funny that different PEs will actually be working on the same output index. Aha, this is a new opportunity that we really must recognize because it's a key aspect of neural network accelerators. And that is spatial reduction or spatial summation, right? One of the most key aspects of this, the uh, idea that Two, P, two workers contributing to the same output index means that a reduction must occur between their partial outputs in order to um, in order to produce the sum. So in other words, if you look at an input, two people working on the same input was a multicast opportunity. Two people working on the same output is a, for lack of a better term, multi-reduce opportunity. So a reduction is the dual of a multicast, right? Yep. And that's where it comes from. That is where multicast comes from. Yep. And again, I don't think we have time to go through the entire example, but here we can see that we do need a spatial sum. And so what you can think of that is you can think of a network between the PEs that's doing that summation. And there's a lot of interesting proposals out there for what that network looks like. Google TPU is a good example. NVIDIA Tensor Core within the SM is another good example. The Tichar's own uh, Mary work is another good example of this spatial sum summation. Yep, and you know, to the first order, it doesn't necessarily matter whether you think of the sum as being inside the worker or outside the worker. I've seen it proposed both ways. Right, Google TPU usually puts this on the inside the worker. The Mary puts it outside the worker. The hardware is kind of still there. They're just kind of moving where the box is drawn, right? So, but sometimes you have hardware that doesn't do spatial sums, right? If you don't do spatial sum, well, then you can't do that data flow on that hardware, right? So this is, this is an example of, okay, not all hardware can do all mappings. Right, And so there's gonna be a notion of this space of potential mappings. And then the idea that we're gonna to have to search around that space to find the good mappings and also to find the legal mappings. And that's, Maestro actually helps with both of those. Yep, so now let's make this more realistic to tie it back into where, where Tushar started us. We can say, okay, we can have a more realistic loop nest with several levels, right? Here I'm saying, okay, I can scale up the number of temporal passes that I have to do over my parallelism. And the general approach that you'll usually see in these is that they'll sort of alternate temporal scale up for reuse, parallel for, uh, for, for performance, then temporal for reuse again. And remember that you can set any of these values, you know, if you say, oh, but I don't want that many loop nest levels, well, yeah, well, think of the loop nest level as there, but just being set to one, right? That's your job. Just set it to one. Yep. And so what you end up with is, is this sort of notion of a fractal or clustered accelerator design where you sort of say, okay, I've got this many 
weight buffers, they distribute to these many L0 weight buffers, and I'm multicasting for this data flow, I'm multicasting weights. For other data flows, I'm not multicasting weights, they get partitioned, but the inputs get multicast. Yep, and it just keeps going and going and going until you actually get to the off chip. So it, as Tishar said, we now have to scale this up to uh, 2D convolution, right? So 2D convolution just means that you have two dimensions, an, a row of each weight and a row of each input. And then you say, okay, there's now two dimensions. So my loop nest is more complicated, right? And you can still say, what is this data flow? It's output stationary, but it's moving across rows faster. So output stationary, row major. You could also have done column major. Yep. And so on and so forth. You can, you can work your way through this, but the CNN problem, problem is now taking these planes and now adding a bunch of planes of inputs and a bunch of planes of weights and now summing, you know, dot producting those things and summing that down. And then of course, if you have multiple output channels, you add another plane of output channels and another cluster of weights. And if you have a batch size, then you would add another whole cluster of, of inputs as Tishar said. And so what you end up with is generally thought of as seven layers for direct convolution. You could, you could also take the approach of changing this into a gem as Tishar said, in which case you would have uh, two matrices each with two indices each. Yep, and you can ask the question, what data flow is this? Output channel, output stationary, row major, right? So this is where, where you need a, a more precise language for describing data flows, which is what Maestro provides. And so that's, that's basically what I'm gonna, where I'm gonna stop. And I've said that, you know, understanding CNN data flow and tiling concepts is critical for any computer architect who wants to focus on domain specific accelerators, especially for machine learning. Interestingly, most accelerators do not use caches. They actually use, you know, uh, special buffers. You could see my buffets paper if you were interested in that. And, you know, the more you understand data flows, the more cool things you can do. For instance, I'd refer you to the UCNN paper to show, oh, here's somebody with a deep understanding of the data flow and scheduling of work and the idea that you can get really uh, interesting efficiency gains. All right, so that concludes my talk. I don't know, do we have time for questions?